Before we get started, tonight's conversation is on the record, and we are live streaming, so please kindly silence your phones, but keep your Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook apps close at hand. As you know, public discussion on global issues is central to our work, and I'd like to highlight one upcoming event that may be of interest to people here tonight. On Wednesday, May 11th, award-winning journalist and senior fellow for global food and agriculture at the Chicago Council, Roger Thoreau, will discuss his new book on ending malnutrition around the world. And if you're not a member of the council, if you buy his book, um, you can join uh, and become a member of the council at a half off. It's a great opportunity. You can talk to me or any of my colleagues afterward if you have any questions about that. Turning back to this evening's discussion, we are delighted to welcome Mr. Ken Roth, Executive Director of Human Rights Watch. Mr. Roth has conducted numerous human rights investigations and missions around the world, and we're grateful that he is able to lend his voice to such an important topic tonight. Human rights are fundamental principles of societies across the world and are protected by international laws. Yet human rights abuses continue to take place in many parts of the world, from drone warfare to government surveillance and to war crimes. A noteworthy example, of course, is taking place in Syria right now, where we're seeing a high number of human rights violations, including persecution, indiscriminate bombings, and millions of refugees <coughs> forced to flee their homes. Mr. Roth has much to contribute to this discussion, and his visit comes at a time of congratulations for his institution. On the same night in April that Angela Merkel was awarded the Four Freedoms Award from the Roosevelt Foundation, Human Rights Watch was given the Freedom from Fear Award, a prestigious honor. Following such a distinction, we're fortunate to have him here with us tonight. Leading tonight's conversation is Mr. Bill Mahoney. Bill is a founding partner of Siegel, McCambridge, Singer, and Mahoney, and serves as the chair of the Human Rights Watch Chicago Committee. He's also a valid member of the Chairman's Circle of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Following their conversation, I will return to moderate the audience Q&A. For now, please join me in welcoming Ken Roth and Bill Mahoney. Uh, thank you very much, John. It, it, it's indeed an honor to have Ken Roth here. Ken is really the dynamic, thoughtful, uh, and highly respected leader of HRW, which is our code name, acronym for Human Rights Watch. Uh, it really is the world's leading human rights organization. It's nonprofit, it's non-governmental, it's nonpartisan. Uh, and there are no sacred cows when Human Rights Watch evaluates uh, a human rights condition in a country or a region. Uh, they investigate abuses, they expose facts, they report them, and then they work for change and for justice. Uh, the organization was originally established in 1978. It's been operating under the current name since 1988. Uh, They've grown to 400 staff members globally. Uh, they operate in 90 countries and generally uh, <coughs> prepare and produce about 100 reports a year. And if you read the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, The Economist, uh, you will see them featured, unfortunately, in this day and age, almost daily, mm -hmm. commenting on uh, situations that they develop around the world. Second thing, all of you should look around. This is a, this is a very appropriate setting to talk about human rights. Uh, the Union League Club has a fascinating history. The, originally, the original Union Leaguers who formed this club were actually radical Republicans back in the 1860s and it had a different meaning then. <laughs> and actually they were strong supporters of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, they urged him to sign the Emancipation Proclamation. They vigorously supported him in 1864 for re-election. And in the Reconstruction period, they were the leading voices for full equality for the, the freed slaves and for, and for voting rights for all African Americans. Uh, secondly, you're surrounded by an art collection that is world class uh, with international and American masters. Uh, and art, I think we all agree, is a symbol of civilization. So we're in a place where it's based on a passion for freedom and liberty and a place that recognizes civilization and human rights and the recognition of human rights will flourish in that environment. So it's a great place to be talking about these issues. Uh, first question and put it into context for everybody and it's gonna be the, always the great question which is the view of things from 40,000 feet. But our context is I think in no time in history, in human history, have the idea that human rights need to be protected, that there are fundamental human rights, and there are important values that we all cherish. At no time in history has that been more recognized in international declarations, in international treaties, in international covenants. Uh, we've got the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We've got the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. 
We've got the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. Uh, all those documents validate and endorse the concepts of freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of association, freedom to politically organize, to be free from torture, to be free from genocide. Uh, there's conventions on refugees and children's rights and women's rights. Everything is covered. And most of those international documents are signed by a vast majority of the countries, the sovereign nations operating today. So they're recognized in principle, but in reality, when we read our newspapers or get on social media or watch television every day, we're overwhelmed by the fact that human rights are abused in extraordinary fashions all across the globe, not just limited to one region. Governments routinely abuse the dignity of their people and ignore those very rights that are codified uh, in those documents. So the first question for Mr. Roth is, how do you reconcile the aspirations of the documents and the reality we're confronting? How do you deal with, and particularly in this modern age with globalization and sort of the social media outburst? Are there special challenges presented today to make the human rights regime a reality. Okay, um, well thanks, Bill. Um, let me just begin by saying um, I, I'm grateful to the Chicago Council for sponsoring this event today. Thank you all for, sh for showing up. And um, it's particularly nice to be back in my hometown of Chicago. The, the Chicago Committee Supporting Human Rights Watch, which, which Bill chairs, I, I, the secret is we really just set this up to give me an excuse to come to Chicago more often. Mm -hmm. um, but um, to, to get to your question, the, I start from the premise that if you're a government, it's convenient to violate human rights. You know, human rights are a pain. Um, they, they, you know, they get in the way of governments wanting to do things quickly. And you know, if, if there's a, an opposition that is dissenting or a, a newspaper that is criticizing, um, you know, human rights are the thing that make it harder to suppress that kind of opposition. You know, it may be that you want to disfavor an ethnic group or discriminate in some other way, and human rights say you can't do that, and you can't just lock up the opposition. So um, governments are always tempted to violate human rights. And the role of the human rights movement is to change the cost-benefit analysis, um, to increase the cost of human rights violations so that whatever advantages governments see in violating human rights don't look as advantageous compared to the cost. And the main way that we do that is by shaming governments that violate human rights. I mean, the good news is that behind all of these treaties is um, the fact in today's world that no government can admit to violating human rights. You know, respecting human rights is a key element of legitimacy for any government. And when you're known as a human rights violator, you lose status among your people, you lose status among your peers with other governments. So when Human Rights Watch is able to you know, investigate and report on human rights violations and then expose them to media coverage, it is shameful, you know, governments hate that. And, and that's when we begin to make progress. Now, you know, how is today different? I mean, apart from all these standards that you've mentioned, I think that the, you know, the, the emergence of social media is actually a great advantage to our work. Um, because, you know, traditionally, when Human Rights Watch would issue a report, we would look to the traditional media to report on that. And so, you know, we would want the Chicago Tribune or WBEZ or whomever to report about it. Um, and, you know, that was very useful. But if you were living in an authoritarian country, there are a finite number of media outlets, and they can be censored. They can be shut down. What social media has done is made it very difficult for governments to silence exposure and discussion of their misconduct. Um, not impossible, but much more difficult. And so I am a huge fan of social media in that you know, it is not only a way for people to hold their governments to account, but it's also a way for people you know, without the need for the traditional media to expose what is going on and to spread it much more widely in the general public. So Human Rights Watch invests a huge amount of effort in social media. We actually have, I think, the, the largest Twitter following of any 
NGO in the world. We have 2.8 million people who follow us on Twitter. You know, another 2 million plus on Facebook. Um, because in, in addition to publishing to the, the press, and the, the traditional press covers us on average 100 times a day, unique articles each day. But in addition to that, we can now spread the word directly to the public, to journalists, to diplomats, to whomever, you know, people follow us. Um, and, and this just gives us an additional tool to pressure governments to respect these treaties that they've signed up for, but they're always tempted to violate. Okay. What, how does Human Rights Watch itself use social media to get the message out? Well, we, when we put out you know, a press release, say, which we do four or five times a day, um, we you know, not only email it to our press lists, we not only put it on our website, but we distribute it through Twitter and through Facebook. And, and that is, you know, if you're a journalist these days, you actually are looking to Twitter to figure out what's going on before you even bother with your email. I mean, that has become, no, I mean, seriously, that has become the major way that people in sort of the professional news business keep up on things. And so it is, and what's wonderful about, you know, social media is that you're not coercing anybody. You know, you're, you're not just flooding their emails with, you know, unwanted spam. They've signed up for you. Um, they want to follow your, your Twitter feed. And so it has been a hugely efficient way to get information out around the world. And I'm, I'm constantly contacted by journalists you know, in countries around the world who say, you know, we just saw your tweet on this. You know, can we talk to you? Can you give us more information? Uh, I'd like to take you a little bit of a kind of a magical mystery tour of the world and human mm -hmm. rights now. Let's start with, I, I think everyone recognizes the big elephant in the room, which is the, the refugee crisis that right now is centered in Europe. I think over a million uh, people from whether Syria, Iraq, uh, North Africa, Afghanistan, uh, based on civil wars, wars, disruption, terrorism, their countries have decided it's in their interest to leave. And they've set off for Europe. Uh, and that has created issues for Europe and the European Union, individual countries, to how to respond. First of all, you could comment generally on the situation. First of all, what's the cause on the ground? Uh, in terms of a human rights perspective that is causing these people to want to leave? And secondly, what's the standard that Europe should be judged on in particular in dealing with these people who are migrating, requesting asylum? And then generally, how have they handled it? And what is the prospect of, of dealing with the situation in the future? How long do you have? <laughs> <laughs> That's why I started with that. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I mean, first, you know, what are they fleeing? I mean, you know, Syria is where almost 50% of them are fleeing. And, you know, the reason for that, and I don't know how much people appreciate this, but the Assad government has chosen to fight this war in a particularly dirty way. You know, war is never fun, but, but war conducted according to the Geneva Conventions is about combatants shooting at combatants. And what Assad has done is to choose to target civilians who happen to live in areas held by the armed opposition. And he's dumping barrel bombs on cities like Aleppo. You know, he's, he's indiscriminately shelling. And so in a, you know, in a classic war, if you live near the front line, you just move a little bit away from the front line and you find a modicum of safety for your family. But in Syria today, Assad is actually bombing you far from the front line because you're just living in opposition held areas. And the only safe place is to leave the country. So that is you know, the big thing that has driven four plus million Syrians out of the country and another six million to be displaced within the country. And these numbers are all growing. Europe, um, I mean, a million crossed the Mediterranean in 2015. Europe, even though you know, there is a rise of the far right in Europe, there's a big political reaction to this, I think it's important to recognize that the crisis in Europe is really um, it's a political crisis. It's not a capacity crisis. Um, a million people <clears throat> represent 0.2% of the population of the European Union. I mean, these, a number like that could be swallowed and you'd barely notice it. Even if they all showed up in Germany, they would still represent just a notch over 1% of Germany. And Germany has already said it can deal with that and it's actually planning on hundreds of thousands of more. So you know, what has given rise to this big political reaction is not the numbers per se, but rather the sense that Europe has lost control of its borders. And that behind 
this influx of legitimate refugees, people really fleeing war and persecution, is this potentially endless supply of economic migrants who also want to get to Europe. And whereas Europe does have an obligation to accept people who are fleeing persecution, it does not have an obligation to accept people who just want a better economic life. So you know, the answer to this, I mean, what, what Europe has done so far has been to cut this deal with Turkey and to say, we're just going to summarily send people back to Turkey. Now, it, it can't just say, no, we're not going to give anybody asylum. Europe actually has a duty to give people individualized asylum hearings once they land in Greece or elsewhere in the European Union. But what they're doing is using this legal trick. Um, under refugee law, if you have, in coming to a country like, you know, like Greece, if you have passed through another safe country, you're obliged to apply there for asylum. You can't choose where you end up. And so Europe is saying, we're going to pretend that Turkey is a safe third country. And therefore, anybody who comes to Greece, we will give you your individualized hearing, but we're going to always come up with the same ruling, which is that you should have applied for asylum in Turkey, so your asylum request in Greece is denied. Now, the problem with this wonderful theory is that Turkey isn't safe. You know, yes, it does have 2.5 million Syrian refugees, but it's also right now um, blocking 100,000 Syrians who are on the Turkish border fleeing the combination of Assad's barrel bombs and ISIS. Um, it doesn't recognize any legal rights for these Syrian refugees. They are there as a matter of discretion. They could be sent back tomorrow to a, a safe zone in Syria. And, and Turkey recognizes no legal obligation toward these people. Um, it at least as a matter of discretion is letting large numbers of Syrians stay. But if you're Iraqi or Afghan, and those represent roughly comparable numbers to the Syrians arriving in Greece, um, you get no rights in Turkey. You get sent back to Afghanistan, sent back to Iraq. So this idea that you know, Turkey is safe is a fiction. And you know, Angela Merkel knows that. And she is now trying to negotiate um, representations from Turkey where they will promise to treat everybody nicely who is returned. But you know, this is the same Turkey, the same President Erdogan, who is flouting basic human rights promises that he's mm -hmm. made to the world not to crack down on the media, not to crack down on dissidents, you know, not to mistreat the Kurds. Um, but we're supposed to believe him suddenly when he promises not to mistreat the returned refugees. And that's sort of where we are right now. But is it another component? I think most of the European leadership, they understand what refugee law is, what asylum law is. Mm -hmm. They understand what the standards are. Aren't they operating in a political environment, though, where they're concerned about a couple of other things? One, that the vast majority of these refugees are Muslim, mm -hmm. and they think that could present a cultural problem in Central and Western Europe in terms of integrating. And secondly, the issue of security and terrorism that ISIS, whatever you want to call it, Daesh, is, could use the vehicle of migration and refugees to infiltrate Western Europe and create havoc. Uh, and they have a huge security issue, and they have a huge political issue with their, with their people. Uh, how do you reconcile those? Because first of all, how valid are they based on the reality on the ground? And secondly, what's your recommendation as to how do you handle that and not abuse the entire human rights mm -hmm. regime? Well, I mean, I think you're, you're right, Bill, to highlight the fact that Europe is doing a poor job of integrating its Muslim population. Um, the, the security threat that it faces is not a threat from first generation refugees. It's a threat from second and third generation, you know, mostly from Northern Africa, from Morocco and Algeria. Um, first generation, you know, typically is so thrilled to be there that they, you know, they put up with the hardship of being a, a new immigrant and they try to build a new life. It's usually the second and third generation, this has been Europe's experience, you know, you, you grow up ethnic Algerian in the banlieue of Paris, um, you speak fluent French, you know France better than you know Algeria, you may never have been in Algeria, but you're never really accepted. You know, you face discrimination, you face abuse by the police, you face limited educational and job prospects. You know, some people just accept that frustration, but some small number, and it doesn't take many, um, is radicalized. And you know, Europe has a problem because it has done such a terrible job of integrating its existing Muslim population that it is facing you know, 
the threat that we've seen in Paris and Brussels recently. Now, you know, there is, with respect to ISIS using the refugee flow to integrate or to infiltrate operatives into Europe, the answer to that is to, to take control of the border. And there is a way to control Europe's borders consistent with refugee rights. And that would be to, you know, first of all, invest enough money in Turkey and Lebanon and Jordan so that a significant number of people choose to stay, stay, stay there. You know, they can see the ability to build a life because there are jobs, there are schools, there are healthcare, you know, there, there are housing and the like. And Europe is now doing that. They promised Turkey six billion euros. They've not made similar promises to Lebanon and Jordan, but that's part of the right idea. The second thing that they have to do, and there are some proposals in Europe to do this, is to radically increase what's called refugee resettlement. That is to say, you screen people not in Greece, you screen them in Turkey. Um, you screen out the security threats, you screen out the economic migrants, but you figure out you know, who is a genuine refugee, and then you accept large numbers of them. You know, Europe is talking about taking maybe a quarter of a million itself. Um, if they're still in Turkey, Europe is in a position to ask the rest of the world to take, say, another quarter million. You know, once they get to Greece, it's Europe's problem. But when they're still in Turkey, they can ask the United States or Australia or Canada or Brazil or whomever to take their share. And if those numbers are large enough, you know, let's say you can have half a million a year coming in to some safe place, people are not going to get on the boats. They're not going to risk their families' lives because there is light at the end of the tunnel with respect to resettlement. And that's you know, a lawful way of regaining control of the border, undermining the security threat, um, but not engaging in this fiction that you're just sending people back to a supposedly safe country that isn't safe. Where do you see the situation going? Where are we going to be at a year from now? I think we're going to see something along the lines of what I'm outlining. In other words, Europe is spending a lot of money in Turkey, and I think they're going to have to spend more. Um, they are talking about significantly increasing resettlement. And the big open question is, you know, will there be sufficient agreement among European nations to accept large enough numbers mm -hmm. so that the incentive to get on a boat and cross the Aegean is substantially diminished? And even though it'll never be eliminated, if most people decide to wait for resettlement rather than getting on a boat, it decreases the political crisis that Europe is facing. Um, it allows Europe to say, look, we've managed this in a way that is lawful, but we're not being flooded by people. You know, and it also reduces the security threat because there are many, many few that are coming irregularly into Europe. And, and those can be more effectively screened than the current chaos where screening is very, very difficult. What has to happen at the source, though, in well, terms of they're migrating, they're leaving Syria because of the conditions on the ground there. In terms of what do you see needs to happen there for their reason for leaving to stop? What has to yeah. go on, whether it's a yeah. no, political I mean, process or something yeah. else? I mean, you're absolutely right to, to go back to the source. And you know, the key is to get Assad to stop targeting civilians. And here, I actually think that Russia's greater military involvement in Syria provides an opportunity. Because it is now clear that Assad's political survival is utterly dependent on Moscow's military presence. So Moscow has real clout in Syria. Um, and if Assad is choosing to barrel bomb Aleppo, we should be publicly asking Putin, why are you letting him do that? Now, that has not been the approach of the US government. You know, John Kerry, who is much more comfortable you know, in the conference room negotiating a deal than he is with public diplomacy, tends to treat Foreign Minister Lavrov as a so-called partner in peace rather than treating Putin as an accomplice in mass murder. And you know, by all means, you know, use the Russians to try to get a peace deal. But at the same time, there should be real public pressure put on Moscow to rein in Assad. And you should make, every single time that there's a, you know, a significant bombing of civilians, you should make Moscow pay a reputational price. And this is a price that they care about because you know, Putin is right now waging a war for European public opinion. He needs to have friends in Europe because he needs the Ukraine sanctions lifted. And so um, if there were real consistent public efforts to tar Putin with Assad's misdeeds, you would see Putin doing a better job of reigning in those misdeeds, and in turn, 
decreasing the reasons why so many Syrians are fleeing the country. Okay. That's a nice transition, because I was going to ask you about Russia and China, because it seems to me that you're talking about if you want to establish an internationally credible human rights regime, uh, where we're really making progress, Russia's a former superpower that still likes to flex its muscles. Yeah. China's the emerging superpower. How do you get them to buy in? First of all, how would you evaluate Russia today in terms of how it handles its own people internally uh, with regard to recognition of basic human rights and how they're acting internationally? Uh, and then we'll go to China. Well, I mean, I can actually in some ways answer for the two countries because okay. they're very, very parallel at this point. Um, and because in both Russia and China today, we are facing, I think it's safe to say, the most intense crackdown in a generation, motivated for very similar reasons. I mean, both Putin and Xi Jinping have made this implicit deal with their people. Um, we will give you greater prosperity. You leave us alone. Let us govern without any significant accountability. And the problem is that neither Putin nor Xi is living up to that bargain. Um, in each case, I mean, in Russia, the economy is going downhill. In China, the growth is significantly slowed. And there are different reasons for each. But in both cases, the presidents are worried that they are not delivering enough prosperity to buy off the people, and that there is growing discontent, which there is. Um, what terrifies each of them is mass mobilization in the streets. Um, as, as any dictator, the last thing they want is for people to be out on the streets protesting against them. And so they are both trying to nip the prospect of any pro uh, protests in the bud. They are, they are going and they are attacking civil society groups. They are shutting down critical media. They're arresting lawyers. They're, they're doing everything they can to prevent people from banding together from organizing and from developing some kind of collective voice of protest. And for, so these are, you know, in many ways, crackdowns of weakness. But that doesn't change the fact that they nonetheless are very intense crackdowns in both places. Use the term civil society for the crowd, for the audience here. What is civil society? And in the modern context, how do you think it's doing in terms, I think I read an article, I think it may have been by you recently, where you talked about the idea that even worldwide civil society is under assault. Yes. Uh, explain how that happens, why it's happening, what's the dynamic? All right, well first, I mean, what I mean by civil society is really just you know, civic groups. Uh, if, if you're an isolated individual, there's a limit to which you can make yourself heard. Um, the way people make themselves heard is by banding together. And there is you know, a significant amplification that comes from, from those numbers. That is all the more true in today's era because of social media. Because you know, traditionally, a civic group, to make itself heard, would appeal to the traditional media. But you know, traditional media can be censored. Um, today, with social media, it's extremely difficult to censor social media. So civic groups have the capacity to mobilize many, many people in the streets. And we saw that you know, in Tahrir Square in Egypt. We saw it um, with the Maidan Revolution in Ukraine. We saw it with Occupy Central in Hong Kong. Um, this is terrifying if you're a dictator. Um, and so, you know, at a moment when civil society has perhaps a greater potential than ever in the past to mobilize people, um, we are seeing governments doing everything they can to shut it down. And, you know, the tool that has become the, you know, kind of the, the sort of tool du jour around the world is to try to cut off the funding for, for, for NGOs, for civic groups. Um, it's easy enough to cut off domestic funding because if you're a big donor domestically, they'll just arrest you or penalize your business or, or whatever. Um, so many of these groups of necessity have to appeal for funds overseas. And what one government after another is doing is using kind of a nationalist appeal to try to cut them off from that foreign funding. They're saying, you know, this constitutes interference in our internal affairs. This is a violation of our sovereignty. Now there is, you know, there, there's a certain richness to this claim, a certain hypocrisy, because the same governments that are actively soliciting foreign investment, they're actively soliciting foreign trade, they're actively soliciting foreign aid for development or for humanitarian purposes, suddenly 
when it comes to foreign contributions to civil society, particularly human rights groups or environmental groups that hold, want to hold the government to account, suddenly that becomes a violation of national sovereignty. Um, but nonetheless, you know, that hypocritical ruse is what governments are doing. And you know, there has been insufficient pushback from the traditional Western defenders of human rights to stop this. And the governments that are getting away with this are decimating the, their local critical civil society. Well, give a tangible example. I mean, human, human Rights Watch is part of you know, the international civil society. You're a major NGO actor. What's Russia's attitude and Putin's attitude toward HRW? What's the Chinese attitude? What's been your experience? Well, I mean, in, in Russia, for example, we actually have a Moscow office, and we've had it for more than 20 years, um, and we're still there. And we are, you know, what Putin has been doing is tarring um, Russian NGOs as foreign agents, which basically in Russian means foreign spy, um, if they receive money. And, and so many Russian human rights groups are in a, a real kind of battle with the government about whether they have to accept that label or not. And the government's putting real pressure on them, you know, with threats of, of, of prosecution if they don't. That's not a problem for us. We're so obviously an international organization to call us you know, a foreign agent doesn't tar us. The other thing that Russia has done is gone after a number of the foreign donors. Mm -hmm. So you know, Soros' Open Society Foundation is shut down. Ford Foundation is shut down. A lot of the big governmental groups like you know, National Endowment for Democracy are shut down. Um, again, an effort to starve Russian civil society. Because Human Rights Watch is not a donor organization, we also are not facing that kind of pressure. Nonetheless, it is an extremely difficult place to operate because our colleagues, you know, the human rights activists in Russia are very much under threat. And these are the people we work with day in and day out. One of the other developments in the uh, last 15, 20 years has been sort of a, a greater emphasis on the laws of war, particularly now the counterterrorism effort, the concern about terrorism, specifically from a human rights perspective. I'd like you to, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. First of all about, we've heard a lot about drone warfare. Uh, I mean, and we've been very actively engaged with that in, uh, the, in the Middle East and in Afghanistan. Are there issues that we need to address or we should be concerned about with regard to standards developing around the use of drones? Uh, yes, yes, very much so. Um, I mean, I, sh I should say first, I mean, dr drones theoretically could be a human rights friendly weapon, which may sound somewhat surprising for me to say that. But what I mean by that is that drones have the potential to be super accurate. You know, unlike an airplane whizzing by, you know, even an airplane with a smart weapon, you know, a drone lingers in place and it can watch for the most opportune time to shoot. You know, meaning a time when there are no civilians around, a time when they're sure that the intended target is actually being aimed at. Um, that's much more difficult with an airplane swishing by. Um, also, you know, the missiles that drones use are, they hit where they're aimed at. You know, they're, they're hyper -act accurate. And, and you can also use, you know, very small warheads, so very small explosives to get the job done which is another way of, of avoiding collateral damage. So those are all you know, attributes of drones that should make them human rights friendly. There are two big problems with how the Obama administration has been using drones. Um, one is you know, the old um, computer term, you know, GIGO, garbage in, garbage out. Um, it, um, if you give bad information, you will shoot poorly. So if the intelligence being fed into the drone operators is misidentifying targets, you're going to be accurately hitting the wrong people. And there have been many cases where that has happened. Um, second, Obama has been very cagey about what the rules are governing drone use, particularly in places like Yemen or Somalia, where the United States is not at war, but it nonetheless is using drones in support of, of a local counterterrorism effort. Um, in war, um, the rules are you can just shoot at the other side's combatants. Um, there's, there's very little constraint on that. If, if, you know, if you see the person, you can shoot them. Um, but that's not what is going on between the United States and, say, Al-Qaeda um, in the Arabian Peninsula. Um, the rules for the kind of law enforcement operation 
that are really going on are much more limited. They say you can use lethal force, but only as a last resort to stop an imminent lethal attack. And you know, Obama knows this, and he's actually given speeches where he articulates these standards, but they refuse to publish the standards that are actually being used by the drone operators. And indeed, they, they start playing games. They say, well, we, we, we fired this drone to stop an imminent strike, but they never articulate what the strike is, and it's clear that you know, there's no imminence there at all. They've just hit somebody who they think is a member of Al-Qaeda, and, and they figure Al-Qaeda at some point will have target, so we'll just call that imminent. And so this kind of game playing with the standards um, is increasing the use of drones, and, and is you know, the more they're used, the more civilians are being killed. And we've seen you know, time and time again that big mistakes are made. You know, wedding parties are hit when they're thought to be you know, Al-Qaeda enclaves or they hit you know, a, a, a taxi cab going down the road, and they actually were, should have hit the one just before that. You know, I mean, big mistakes, mm -hmm. which Human Rights Watch has documented from the ground numerous times. Another component on the counterterrorism thing in terms of the battle between security, to use the term protecting the homeland, and then issues of privacy. Uh, does Human Rights Watch, first of all, engage and evaluate these issues, specifically talking about like the collection of phone metadata yeah. records, surveillance? Uh, now they're talking about encryption, having back doors to breaking up encrypted systems. Mm -hmm. What are the issues there as we go forward? Because it, it appears they're going to intensify. Well, let's take the metadata first. Um, I mean, until the Snowden disclosures, the NSA was scooping up all of our metadata en masse and putting it in a government computer. Now, metadata is basically everything but for the content of your phone and email communications. So, you know, who were you telephoning? Who were you emailing? Um, in some sense, where were you going? Because your phone is like, a, you know, a GPS device. Um, all of that data was going into a government computer. And that data, often can be more revealing than the content of the communications. It's certainly easier to access, you know, to, to listen to a phone conversation and transcribe it and all is, is time consuming. But you know, if by, by looking at your metadata, you can figure out you know, who your friends are, who your associates are. You know, are you seeing a lawyer? Are you seeing a psychiatrist? You know, I mean, you can learn a lot about a person through metadata. And that was all being collected with the rationale being, we need a haystack to find the needle, which you know, sounds great in theory. Um, you know, how are we going to ever find that needle of the terrorist communication if we don't collect the haystack, everything? Um, the problem with this massive invasion of our privacy is it wasn't doing any good. Uh, the NSA was asked to identify, you know, give us a terrorist plot that you broke up through this mass collection of metadata. And at first they said, oh, you know, we can name 50 plots. And when they started being probed, it turned out that they could actually only name one plot, and it wasn't even really a plot. It was a, a guy who had sent $8,500 to Somalia. And that was their best case. Uh, there were actually two different commissions set up with access to um, highly classified information to examine this, and they found that there was no value added in all this mass collection of metadata. Huge expense, huge invasion of our privacy, didn't do any good. So you know, now Obama has, um, in principle, agreed to stop putting this in a government computer. They're going to ask the internet companies and the phone companies to hold it, and they will then do more targeted subpoenas. And if that's the program, that's much more compatible, because we don't object to you know, listening or reading emails on the basis of probable cause. If you have you know, reason to believe that a crime is being committed, just as you can search your house or you know, listen to your, you know, wiretap your phone with a proper court order, so you should be able to look at your mm -hmm. metadata, fair enough. But we hope that we're moving away from this mass collection of metadata. On the question of encryption, you know, the, the US law enforcement agencies and intelligence agencies are obviously upset that Predictably, once people found out about the mass intrusion on our privacy, they moved to encryption. So they've got themselves to blame for this big movement to encryption. And they're asking, well, you know, shouldn't we force Apple to put a backdoor into your iPhone so that that way 
you know, if the US government really needs it, maybe with a court order, they can get into your phone. And you know, the problem is that you know, whatever backdoor is created for the good guy US intelligence agencies, you can ensure that the bad guy hackers and the bad guy Chinese and you know, lots of other people are gonna hack in there too. There's no such thing as a backdoor only for the good guys. You know, once you create a vulnerability, it's there for anybody to exploit. And there are many, many people out there who are actively looking for that. Which is why, again, I think the administration is backing off, and in fact, it's not even clearly asked for this backdoor. Um, I think they recognize that this would decimate privacy, and that they're gonna have to figure out other ways to get at encrypted information. I should say, by the way, that metadata is never encrypted, because metadata has to be read you know, by the system. I mean, the metadata gets your email from here to there, and if it's encrypted, it doesn't get there. So the only thing that's encrypted is the content of communications. The metadata is still there to be exploited, mm -hmm. but with a court order, not through mass scooping up. The Western Hemisphere will do bullet points on this and get, you, get your comments on it in terms of changes that are going on, uh, the human rights impact, the challenges ahead. Number one, Cuba, we've normalized relations. Obviously, the economic embargo is still in place. You know, what is your sense uh, of the future of Cuba? Cuba's obviously never been uh, viewed as a, uh, someone who's totally bought into the human rights regimen. Uh, I think the president in his speech when he was down there made a big point of saying that was really gonna be a necessary element of going forward. You know, what's your assessment of the prospects uh, in Cuba? Well, I should say that Human Rights Watch very much favored the lifting of the embargo, really on grounds of practicality. Um, we'd had this for you know, how many decades now. It not only was it not doing any good, but it was actually doing quite a bit of harm, you know, harm to ordinary Cubans, but also harm to the effort to promote human rights. Because you know, Cuba was long used to resisting pressure from the United States. The way to move things in Cuba is really multilateral pressure from other Latin American governments. But none of them was willing to join in that effort because they didn't want to have anything to do with the embargo. And so lifting the embargo was really a prerequisite to getting a multilateral strategy. And now we're beginning to approach people like President Macri in, in Argentina, or um, Peña Nieto in Mexico, or Bachelet in Chile, to see if you know, some of the more human rights friendly governments might be able to start putting serious pressure on, on Cuba. Raul Castro and certainly Fidel are resisting rapid liberalization. Um, Raul is trying very incremental liberalization. And indeed is, you know, even though he's talking about retiring in a couple of years, he's trying to engineer a succession plan which keeps a lot of the dinosaurs in charge. And there is clearly a strong desire for reform among the Cuban people, and I think even among a, a next generation mm -hmm. of officials who recognize that the economy is going nowhere and that there's a need to you know, bring Cuba into the modern age. But the, the key is to you know, get past some of the troglodytes that are still running things now. The more pressure from Latin American governments, the better for that purpose. How about Colombia? There's a negotiation between the government and, and FARC for a civil war that's been going on 50 years. Venezuela, from a perspective from here, looks like it's uh, in retreat and falling apart. Brazil has conflicts. Yeah. One is just a comment on, on those events politically, but particularly in your role, does the political instability in these places, how does that impact human rights? and the average citizen, uh, and are they like collateral damage when you have these situations that are so unstable? Well, I mean, you have to answer that almost case by case. I mean, in Venezuela where, you know, clearly the economy is falling apart, um, Maduro is utterly incompetent. Um, you know, he was getting a lot of mileage over the argument that, well, you know, at least we've, we're looking out for the poor. Um, and, and certainly when Chavez was there and when the oil prices were high, they were spending a lot of money on the poor. Um, Human Rights Watch just did a report to try to kind of show the reality of these claims. And we actually looked at how um, under Maduro, the government is going into you know, shanty towns or areas where the poor live, and it's been just arbitrarily knocking down whole blocks of housing for, you know, for various development reasons, which was a very effective report because it undercut the the ideology that the government was using to support it. Um, you know, today there is a huge movement to get rid of Maduro. There's been like 1.8 million signatures or something like that seeking his ouster. 
they're now being reviewed, but we could easily see a referendum coming up for his removal. And I think given the tenor in, in Venezuela, that's likely to prevail. The role we've been playing is to try to you know, maintain the political space for the opposition to operate. We're trying to press for the release of political prisoners like Leopoldo Lopez. Um, Colombia, I mean, you mentioned this deal with the FARC. Everybody wants peace between you know, the government and, and FARC. The question is on what terms. And what has complicated things is that the FARC is trying to negotiate a deal where it's not going to face prison time for the war crimes that it was responsible for. And what makes the situation complicated in Colombia is that the army favors impunity for the FARC, the opposite of what you would think. But the army is figuring whatever the FARC can get away with, we can get away with. And the army is worried because it was responsible for these thousands of so-called false positive killings. Um, this was a few years ago where the army would round up poor young men, dress them up in FARC uniforms, and execute them as a way of increasing their statistics, They're called false positives as a result. And you know, these are obvious war crimes. They're terrified of prosecution. And they see the negotiations with the FARC as a way of getting the same sweetheart deal. So what the FARC is asking for right now is basically, instead of imprisonment, community service for mass murder. Um, and they, they are proposing, which President Santos seems like he's willing to sign off on, um, that you would get five to eight years of community service as a consequence of having engaged in war crimes. And then by cor you know, corollary of that, mm. so would the military for the false positive killings. So we are actively trying to stop that. The, the real kind of ace we have up the sleeves is that um, Colombia has ratified the International Criminal Court Treaty. And the International Criminal Court has weighed in, the prosecutor, Fatu Bensouda, explaining that nowhere in the world has community service ever been accepted for large-scale killings. Mm -hmm. The minimum is some reasonable period in prison. And if Colombia doesn't provide for that, then the International Criminal Court will step in and do its own prosecutions. And that is very serious leverage that we have to push Colombia to do the right thing and have some form of reasonable justice, reasonable consequence um, for, for the war crimes that have been committed. My final two questions before we go to the audience. Uh, number one, there's been discussion of being, of being free from environmental degradation or being free from the consequences of climate change is the new human right as part of the regime. First of all, what is your reaction to that and how does HRW fit in? And then secondly, as we've gone around the globe, I think we've isolated, uh, actually done the opposite of isolating, but I think what we've shown is there are systemic human rights violations around the world. Uh, are there things you can point to which give you optimism about the future, that tomorrow will be better than today in terms of how the world, at least incrementally, starts to advance and incorporate a respect for human rights around the world? Okay, well first, I mean, on, on climate change, I think that there are human rights issues both in the reason for climate change and also in the way the world should respond to climate change. Let me explain what I mean by that. Um, if you have, I mean, one of the ways that you have governments acting in an environmentally irresponsible way is by suppressing the human rights, the environmental activists, you know, the environmental groups they would try to keep them operating properly. And so you know, defending civil society, the way we were speaking earlier, is an important way of addressing climate change because you empower the environmentalists in a, in a community. Um, you also find that you know, in a place like Indonesia, where I was just a few weeks ago, um, a big part of climate change is you know, illegal logging in the rainforest. And you find this you know, in spades in a place like Indonesia, where the army operating above the law has been engaged in massive deforestation in order to create um, palm oil plantations. Um, and it gets away with this because it stands above the rule of law. It uses violence to prevent anybody from holding it to the rule of law. And so bringing the army under the rule of law, you know, a, a key human rights concern, is going to be essential for fighting this massive 
contribution to climate change. Because I should note that not only is the rainforest destroyed, but it's destroyed by burning it, which throws you know, so much smoke into the air that there are periods each year in Southeast Asia where you can't even fly an airplane around, let alone breathe, because there's so much smoke in the air. So you know, I see you know, paying attention to human rights not as a panacea, but as an important contribution to fighting climate change. Nonetheless, we have a changing climate. And that is causing real dislocation for people, you know, particularly in, in arid parts of the world that are becoming more arid, or in areas you know, close to sea level where you find flooding. And we are pressing governments to be attentive to the most vulnerable people as they develop their climate change adaption policies. So you know, that, we, we did a, a report recently on, on Lake Turkana, um, which is the, the largest desert lake in the world in northwestern Kenya, which is drying up in part because of climate change with, with huge consequences for people. And we're pushing the government of Kenya as it adapts to this to make sure that it is paying, giving special attention to the most vulnerable people who are suffering from this. We did something similar looking in, um, in Bangladesh where we actually found that a major cause of child marriage is climate change because as the waters are rising, people's land is insecure and they're marrying off their daughters just to get rid of the need to support them and to raise money. Um, and so you know, these, these connections that you would never anticipate are, are arising, and, and you're going to see more and more of this around the world. So using a human rights lens to try to mitigate the impact of climate change on the, the most vulnerable sectors of society is, is a very important thing. And indeed, Human Rights Watch is, is in the process of launching a new program on the environment and human rights that will address these kinds of issues. Um, Bill, your, your big question about you know, what gives rise to optimism. I mean, I've been doing this work for a while. And when I think back to you know, 20, 25 years ago when I was starting, um, there are many parts of the world today that are much better than they were when I started. I mean, when I started, Latin America was mostly a bunch of military dictatorships. You know, today you still have your Cubas and Venezuelas, but you largely have functioning democracies. You know, Eastern Europe was a bunch of communist dictatorships. Today, it's you know, mostly members of the European Union and imperfect democracies. You know, we've got Orban, we've got Kaczynski, but, but nonetheless, um, you know, much, much better off than they were. Um, and you can say the same thing about East and Southeast Asia, about Southern Africa, but then there are the problems. You know, there's the Middle East, which is a mess. There's, there's um, there are problems and you know, persistent problems in Central Asia. And you know, coming back to where we started, um, you know, that's why persistent pressure is needed. You know, there are always going to be problems. I'm actually not one who believes in inevitable progress. You know, I believe in inevitable temptation and the need to fight that temptation to violate human rights. You know, the good news is that we have a much stronger movement today than we had 20 years ago. We have activists in virtually every country around the world with, you know, with the exception of the most repressive like North Korea. But most places I go, almost every place I go, there are local human rights activists. And we have ease of communication in a way that we didn't have in the past, which greatly facilitates the work of defending human rights. Right. Off to you, John. Thank you, Ken and Bill. This is phenomenal. All right, we have about 20 minutes left for our audience questions. We covered a lot of ground, and we're, we're happy to explore other areas or go deeper into some of the content we've covered already. So if anyone has a first question, otherwise I'm going to kick it off. Okay, we've got quite a few over in this area. Let's start over here. I saw, yep, about the fifth row back there. Oh, hi. Hi, thank you for being with us today and for your insightful remarks. Um, in your initial comments, you addressed Human Rights Watch's strategy of shaming or um, kind of using that public shame to leverage human rights causes. Um, but I'm wondering, in situations like the Northern Triangle uh, countries of Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, uh, where the issue is not so much an authoritarian or dictatorial power, but the lack thereof and the lack of um, rule of law that is driving tens of thousands of refugees nonetheless to our southern borders and elsewhere. Uh, what kind of leverage is there? What, what is Human Rights Watch's strategy and what can be done by governments? Thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, there, there are two kinds of leverage that I'll highlight. I mean, one is directly on the governments in question because, I mean, you're right, the problem is the rule of law or the lack thereof. Um, behind that is massive corruption and governments that benefit from that corruption um, and are not interested in applying the rule of law. And so putting pressure on them to allow the rule of law to prevail is one part of our strategy. 
The thing that has been probably the most successful in those countries you mentioned was in Guatemala, where there is um, this thing goes by the initial CICIG, C-I-C-I-G. But the Guatemalan government was pressured to accept the creation of an international prosecutor. So there's not an international tribunal, but there's an international prosecutor to make these difficult corruption and violence cases. And they, they had to accept it. And that has been hugely successful in building cases against powerful officials who otherwise were untouchable. And these cases are then pursued through the courts. And so that's a model that we're now trying to replicate in Honduras and El Salvador as well. The other source of leverage is actually the United States, you know, driven in part because so many people are fleeing Central America for the United States. Um, and, and when they get there, they have very legitimate claims to asylum. So we're pushing the US to um, you know, invest in rule of law programs, but also, frankly, to change the drug war. Because it's the drug war that has allowed so many of these cartels to flourish. Um, and and you know, we should know by now, after decades of trying, that the drug war approach is not working. And a, a different you know, approach focused on harm reduction rather than criminal prosecution is what's needed to address some of these problems. If you'd really change the market forces that are supporting the cartels that are behind so much of the Central American violence, um, you would make an enormous difference for those people, the people of those countries. Great, let's, let's stay in this area here and then we'll come to the other side of the room. So come up into the fourth row. These two gentlemen here will go one and then the next. Uh, good evening. What would you say is causing this political backlash against the Syrian refugees, both here in the US and over in Europe? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's the issues that Bill alluded to. It's, it's partly Islamophobia, it's partly fear of terrorism. Um, you know, the Islamophobia, obviously we're seeing parts of that here. It's more intense in Europe. Um, the, the percentage of the Muslim population in Europe is larger. Um, Europe does a poorer job of integrating its Muslim populations. On security, I've got to say, the, the, you know, let's talk about the United States. We, we talked about Europe already. There is something utterly irrational about the you know, political exploitation of the prospect of Syrian refugees arriving in this country. I mean, put yourself in ISIS's shoes for, imagine, for a moment. You know, imagine you are sitting in Raqqa, and you want to infiltrate an ISIS operator, operative into the United States, what would you do? Would you send them as a refugee where they have to go through multiple rounds of screening and it takes minimum two years and, and odds are you're never gonna make it through the process, process because you know, Obama's only accepted 2,000 of the minuscule promised 10,000? Or would you go as a tourist or a business person or you know, a student, um, people who have basically no screening at all and who come in by the you know, millions every year. So this focus on Syrian refugees is really, I think, just a political football, a way to try to, to tar Obama. Um, and it's you know, sort of shame on the people who are doing that, but also shame on Obama to succumbing to it. Obama should be standing up and saying, this is ridiculous. These are the last people who pose a security threat, and I'm gonna do the right thing, um, you know, both for the Syrian people, but also for Angela Merkel, because I don't want the European Union to collapse over this, so America is gonna step up its refugee acceptance from you know, 10,000 to 100,000 a year. That would be the courageous thing to do. Okay, the gentleman right next to him. Um, hello. Um, my question has two dimensions. Uh, first one is, how can we use uh, emblematic cases of enforced disappearances to promote those cases that don't come out in the public media or are not as famous. And I want to relate this, this question to what is happening now in Mexico after the uh, 43 missing students. We know that now uh, the international experts group has uh, well finished his work in Mexico and he's been persecuted by the government. And um, and one line that they suggested, and I think this is why it is relevant for, for this city, was that uh, the police attacked the students because they were uh, looking for a bus that was carrying heroin to bring to the city of Chicago. So I don't know if you can relate yeah. both. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I mean, you're, I think most of you are probably familiar with this case. Um, and the, you know, what happened to those 43 students happens to thousands of people across Mexico. But this was such um, an outrageous situation. 
you know, when they were just students, too, the numbers were large, um, that it, it, it came to notice. And it does provide us an opportunity because the government's cover story has been so transparently false. Um, you know, they claim that it was just you know, drug traffickers who did this, they burned all the bodies, and we don't know where they are. But in fact, you know, it, it's, it, this international experts group has shown that there are huge holes in that cover story, that people were tortured in order to say that, and that it just doesn't make any sense. And indeed, they've gone a bit further, as you note, to show that there are witnesses showing that the police were all over this case as it was happening. So this was not just some autonomous drug cartel. That insofar as you know, drug dealers were involved, they were involved because the, the police were working with them. And this is you know, the heart of the problem in Mexico today um, because the drug cartels have completely infiltrated um, with, with law enforcement. And you know, various Mexican presidents have attempted to address this. You know, there's been the effort to create a, a federal police force because the assumption was that local police forces were too vulnerable to some combination of violence and corruption. But then the claim is that the federal police were actually watching this unfold as well. So I, I hope that this um, pushes the Mexican government to end its complicity in the war on drugs. You know, Calderon, the, the prior president, radically ratcheted up the war on drugs approach. And Peña Nieto, now the current president, has kind of, has not been as intense a pursuer of that war, but hasn't really changed it. And this should be an opportunity to recognize that, you know, the only way to break this liaison between the police and the drug dealers is to change the market. And to, you know, the war approach, the criminalization approach, creates the market that gives so much money to allow this corruption to proceed. And the only way to change that dynamic is to destroy the market through some kind of decriminalization and regulation process. There is you know, movement in this direction, and even Peña Nieto is doing this with respect to marijuana, but there's a need to do it more broadly now. Right, there's a woman directly behind in the next row. Yeah, let's go to you next. First, I wanted to say thank you so much for being here. You provided a lot of excellent insights. Um, my question pertains to US drone usage. So with new technologies like legal autonomous weapon systems and such, how, what way do you see um, gov uh, NGOs like Human Rights Watch or other governments, what is the best way for them to put pressure on the US to be more accountable for their drone usage and also make sure that future technology does not result in more deaths? Okay. Well, I mean, with respect to drones, the way Human Rights Watch has done it is that we go into a place like Yemen, and after there's an attack, we try to go to the site of the attack and figure out what happened. You know, the U.S. never reports this stuff. Um, and, and they just say, oh, we didn't have assets on the ground, we don't know. Um, so we try to be that asset on the ground and publicly report what we find. And it's very illuminating when you do that. Um, it's not always possible to get to this territory, but it often is. And, and we've been doing that. You mentioned fully autonomous weapons, um, which is a weapon system that has never actually been developed yet, but is being threatened. Um, and the idea is, with a drone at least, you know, there's obviously a lot of automation in a drone, but there is a person who pulls the trigger. So before the weapon is actually activated, a person decides to pick this target and to shoot toward that target. Fully autonomous weapons would not have that person in the loop. They would be set off with a computer program, you know, look for people with this attribute or look for this kind of target, and the weapon on its own through this computer program would identify a target and shoot. So we, we call these killer robots, but these fully autonomous weapons are, are, would really be a, a radical transformation, because you can imagine um, you know, the difficulties of developing a computer program that has the judgment needed to know, you know, whether that man walking down the, the, the road in Yemen carrying a rifle is that, you know, a farmer, because everybody carries a rifle in Yemen, or is it an Al-Qaeda operative? Or, you know, should you shoot at this person, you know, when his family is around him, or could you wait until two hours later when you know the person's family is going to be away? Or, you know, even if this person is a legitimate target, maybe you just don't need to kill this person because it's not that important for the broader war effort. And just as a matter of co compassion, you choose not to. I mean, these are a lot of judgments that people make in war um, that killer robots would have a hard time doing. So Human Rights Watch has actually been leading a campaign to try to ban killer robots before they are developed. 
you know, once they're developed, it's very hard to put that genie back in the bottle. But we're trying to get people not to develop it in the first place. Um, the US has actually adopted sort of guidelines which would, um, so, you know, that kind of discourage the development of these weapon systems. For now, they are refraining from it, but they have not committed to never developing them. And what we need is, you know, real leadership from a number of the technological leaders to refrain from this, and that's how you can build a broader treaty against it. We're in the middle of working on this right now, um, but it's, you know, it's an active campaign. Yeah, if you want to know more about that topic, we actually hosted a debate um, with Steve and Goose from Human Rights Watch. Um, and it was about two years ago. We have it, the audio and the video online. It goes really deeply into this topic. All right, other questions? I feel like this side of the room we haven't quite hit yet. Let's come up to this row here. And we'll go here and then here next. So over its history, the World Bank has funded some projects which turned out to be rather epic disasters. Mm -hmm both in terms of environmental destruction and human rights impact. Are there any projects right now that the World Bank is involved in that Human Rights Watch is particularly concerned with? But what we've been pushing with the World Bank is for them to adopt standards that explicitly look at the human rights consequences of proposed projects. Um, and they've done that with respect to environmental standards. It's now pretty accepted that they should look at that. There is big resistance within the bureaucracy to doing that on human rights issues. And you know, Jim Kim, the president, is, is a decent guy on this and I think is, is sympathetic toward doing it. In a few cases, he's actually intervened to stop projects. But the entire culture of the bank treats human rights as a so-called political issue. And the charter says it's not supposed to get into politics. And it's easy to you know, look at it differently. It's easier to say, you know, the World Bank, like every other institution, has a duty to avoid complicity in human rights violations. So it should not be funding projects where it knows that that's going to lead to, you know, for example, massive forced displacement without due process. Um, and, you know, or, or that it's not going to lead to um, you know, drying up an entire area where it's going to force people to, to leave. I mean, you know, there are many, many consequences you can see which right now the World Bank is reluctant to formally look at. Um, there are other ways that human rights enter the picture as well. The, the bank is in principle committed to consulting with local communities before approving a, a program. And the idea is, you know, you shouldn't just let the government claim what the needs of the people are, you should ask the people. Um, but for that to work, you need to have a degree of freedom for people to speak out, to organize together, to, you know, to make their voices heard. So, you know, the World Bank has theoretically an interest in having a free press, a free civil society. Does it do anything about that? No. Um, and so these are you know, areas where we're working right now. And there is big resistance, you know, both by the World Bank bureaucracy, but also by a number of the beneficiary countries that really don't want these questions asked about themselves. Great. Here in the second row. Microphone's coming. Yeah, Despot is right here in the, about the fourth person in. I'd like to hypothesize two combatants. And let's assume that combatant B embeds themselves in civilian populations to attack combatant A. What's the Human Rights Watch guidance to combatant A? Um, yeah, I mean, it's not just Human Rights Watch guidance. The international law is quite clear on this. I mean, one, there is a duty to um, avoid using civilians as shields. You know, to take all, in fact, there's a broader duty to take all feasible precautions to avoid harm to civilians. So if you're the person firing, um, you have a duty to not hide among civilians. Um, then let's say you do that nonetheless. Um, the fact that you have violated the Geneva Conventions in firing from a civilian population does not mean that the other side can then rip up the Geneva Conventions. Um, the Geneva Conventions don't work that way because if, if a violation by one side excused violations by the other side, you would have no Geneva Conventions left because you always have you know, an abuse someplace and you'd get this spiral, this downward spiral of non-compliance. So the Geneva Conventions continue to apply to the, to the other side in this case, your, your side A. And they, um, you know, the rule there is that they have to fire in a way that does not cause disproportionate harm. So, you know, if let's say, you know, the first attacker is firing from a school um, and there are a bunch of school children sitting around, that's a violation of fire from that school, 
but to fire back and kill all those school kids just to retaliate it against that attacker would also be a violation. That would be a disproportionate attack. And so the duty really on the, you know, the retaliator is to find opportunities to fire back that do not cause disproportionate harm to the civilian population, even recognizing that the use of human shields is wrong. Some, some more questions here. We'll go here in the fourth row, and then we'll come here next. I'd like to talk about <coughs> Turkey for a moment. Um, obviously, there are massive human rights violations by the government, particularly Erdogan, against the press, against Kurds, uh, against a whole bunch of other political enemies. Um, and yet it seems the world is uh, ignoring those in exchange for the bargains that they're making, one, on refugees, and two, U.S. air bases being, being able to use in, in order to um, uh, uh, fly over Syria, et cetera. Um, I'd like your comment as to whether or not we are eff effectively acquiescing in these by ignoring them, or uh, the, does the cost-benefit analysis go away under the kind of geopolitical considerations that are being applied to Turkey right now? Yeah, I mean, you're, Bill, you're absolutely right about that dynamic. And, uh, I mean, let me just sort of give a bit of history to show how bad Turkey is. <coughs> um, because, you know, Erdogan, for the first seven, eight years as prime minister, actually was moving Turkey in a positive direction. It was a period when um, European Union accession was at least theoretically a possibility. It was never likely, but it was at least theoretically open. And he also had certain self-interest in subordinating the Turkish military. And so um, he did that. The, the press became much freer. Um, civil society became freer. Torture diminished. Um, he made peace with the Kurds. Um, discrimination against the Kurds was reduced. So things were looking pretty good. Um, but Erdogan, you know, it kind of got to his head, and he, be he began to have these imperial ambitions. <coughs> um, he thought, you know, as autocrats often do, that he had superior knowledge and wisdom over everybody else. And so the beginning of the end was, I guess, about three years ago now, during the so-called Gezi Park protests in Istanbul. Um, he wanted to chop down the trees in a park and build a shopping center and a mosque. And there are not that many parks in Istanbul, so there were big protests. Um, and he was appalled that the people of Istanbul you know, didn't see the wisdom of his way. He responded with tear gas and beatings. Um, and that began this kind of this crackdown. What completely pushed him over the edge was, I guess now a little over two years ago, um, somebody released audio tapes of Erdogan calling his son at home and saying, hide the money, the police are coming. <laughs> and you know, that led him initially to shut down YouTube so people couldn't gain access to the audio tape. But it also, um, he blamed the so-called Gulenists for this release. Um, Gulen is a, a cleric who was an ally of Erdogan for many years. Um, he um, lives in Pennsylvania in exile. Um, but he has this large following of people and they um, put a lot of emphasis on education and have built this whole following, particularly among prosecutors, um, the police, judges, you know, kind of law enforcement. There are many, many Gulenists there. And Erdogan said, this is a plot by the Gulenists to discredit me by releasing this supposedly false but actually not audio tape. So he went on a rampage against the Gulenists. He started cracking down on the press so they wouldn't talk about this. He began cracking down on civil society and dissidents. Um, the Kurds were able to escape for a while because Erdogan was term limited out as prime minister, but wanted to become president and could easily get himself named president, but president was a figurehead position in Turkey. He wanted to be powerful, so he needed to change the constitution. He didn't have the majority needed to do that. He wanted the Kurds to vote with him. Um, unfortunately, so he started making peace with the Kurds, but a moderate Kurdish party emerged and actually deprived Erdogan of his majority. So he then like, reopened the war against the Kurds and has been absolutely cracking down on them. So you know, this is, at this stage, an autocrat. It's gone to his head. He is systematically dismantling the checks and balances on, on his power that exist in Turkish democracy. And it is extremely short-sighted for um, Europe, you know, whether for the refugee deal or the United States for access to Insular Lake Air Base, to be giving him the soft treatment for what is clearly you know, the worst place Turkey has been in human rights terms in 15, 20 years. 
We're very nearly out of time. I want to make sure we get in Dr. Cole's question. So let's try to keep it brief. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, should we not be putting a lot more moral and political pressure on the United States and the Gulf states, particularly Qatar and Saudi Arabia, for financial contributions to the refugee crisis? I mean, the United States, Qatar, Saudi Arabia have been providing lots of assistance to the rebels in Syria. They are responsible for the Syrian civil war, as many, as many other outside parties are. And yet, we don't hear anything about putting pressure. Let's assume that the United States and Saudi Arabia don't want to take in the refugees, but the least they could do would be providing billions of dollars to assist in the resettlement of these refugees elsewhere. They bear major moral and legal responsibility. And it should not be just up to the Europeans, simply because by the accident of geography, they happen to be right next to the Middle East. Well, I mean, it's a good question. I actually think that Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states should be taking in refugees as well. They're actually quite willing to spend money, um, but they're not willing to take in people as refugees. You know, they'll let them come in as workers with no rights to stay um, because they want to maintain their citizenship small so they don't have to carve up the oil pie in too many pieces. But the, the two things that I would like to see pressure on the Saudis in particular on, I mean, one is their funding of Wahhabi imams around the world which has provided a real ideological base for ISIS and Al-Qaeda and a lot of other jihadists. Um, you know, the, the Saudi royal family gets its legitimacy as the guardians of, of Mecca and Medina, the holy cities. And even though the Saudi royal family, I don't think is terribly religious at this stage, they have um, sort of cut this deal with the Saudi clerics. And part of the deal is that they can promote their Wahhabi school of thought with massive funding around the world. And that has you know, contributed to the radicalization of Muslim populations in many parts of the world. Um, the other thing, you know, which we haven't talked about today, is Yemen. Um, but this is in another area where there's a real need for pressure on the Saudis. Because you know, using US advanced military technology, the Saudis have been killing a huge number of civilians in Yemen. Um, and I don't know whether they don't know how to operate these these weapons properly, or whether they just don't care. But um, these are weapons that are, you know, should be precision weapons, and they're using them very precisely to hit civilians. They're also using US cluster bombs, which are inherently indiscriminate. And those, of course, kill many civilians as well. So I'd like to see a lot more pressure on the Saudis to rein in the way they're fighting the war in Yemen, and to target you know, the Houthi rebels, but not civilians who happen to be living in those areas. We unfortunately need to stop there. Please join me in thanking Ken Roth for his comments tonight.